Okay, you all, I think we have critical mass. So I'm going to turn it over to Lisa Clarkson and Catherine Sparks. I think you all are just going to be blown away by what they're going to be sharing with you this afternoon. I had a chance to hear it yesterday and I was just dumbfounded. I was sitting on the edge of my chair the whole time. So take it away, ladies. I am Catherine and it's great to be with you all today. I am a massage therapist at Body Dynamics, and for many years I have been cueing my clients on the table to take a deep breath. I have been a mover all my life, and in one practice I regularly follow called Interplay, we are invited always to take a deep breath and let it out with a sigh. So why don't we all do that? Take a deep breath. <sighs> <laughs> Over a year ago, the nudge came to start exploring breath more deeply, and this led me to begin a class here at the clinic called Breathe, Move, Relax. This has been a really fun way for both myself and the participants to simply notice our breath and practice deep breaths. So. We are here today to explore more, and in my excitement about breath, I teamed up with my colleague and friend, Lisa, and we are delighted to share what we are continuing to explore and practice ourselves. Lisa. Thank you, Catherine. That was such a well-spoken introduction. I think mine might be a little bit more conversational. And thanks, Gwen, for the introduction. I'm not sure if you introduced yourself or not. Um, so as Catherine said, my name is Lisa Clarkson. I work at Body Dynamics as well. I work as a physical therapist and a Pilates instructor. And I've been doing Pilates for a, a long time. I think the first time I was exposed to it was when I was 16 years old, but I started really doing it um, somewhat religiously, I would say, in the early 90s. I've been teaching since 1998. And for those of you who know about Pilates, what the first principle of Pilates is the breath. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that principle later on. So my knowledge of breath being something that's good for you has kind of been in my um, mind and in my body for a long time. I've also practiced yoga on and off. And I have to say that while we've been during the, in this pandemic, I've been doing that a little bit more. But the science part of this has really um, come into the forefront for me as I've been taking coursework with an institute called the Postural Restoration Institute. And um, they have a lot of practical and experiential ways to use the breath, but they also back it up with a lot of science. And that's been really fun for me. You'll see, I get pretty excited about it because it's just so cool that what we know intuitively has some basis in the scientific world. I think we're ready. So um, what we're going to discuss today is the what, the why, and the how of breathing. When we talk about the what, what, I'm really talking about what is breath, how should it be done, what are the mechanics that happen in a normal breath cycle, what's the ideal function of our musculoskeletal system when we're breathing. Then we're, we're going to talk about the why. And what I mean by that is, what are the, why, why do we care? <laughs> you know, why should we have a good breath pattern? What's so important about it? And we'll discuss the musculoskeletal implications of that. And we'll talk about the neurophysiological implications of that. With that, we'll even talk about the psychological implications of breathing well. And along the way, we're going to be trying out these different techniques together so that you not only get to think about it, but maybe you'll have a little bit of an experience of it. 
Here is a poem that I wrote a few weeks ago. Breath is involuntary and voluntary, strengthening and calming, a guide and a pathway, anatomical and transformational, a pause and a suggestion, clarifying and renewing, a thought and an afterthought, light and heavy, dependable and vulnerable, life-giving and necessary, predictable and generous, coordinated and in sync. And we are grateful for the beauty, the wonder, the gift of breath. So uh, we come to a time where we get to practice a little bit to start off with. So um, this little exercise is going to last about a minute. And I invite you to get comfortable. If you're, if you're seated, just shake out a little bit maybe and have your feet on the floor. You can also lie down for this. Um, so just to be in a comfortable position. And what we're doing here is not altering our breath or controlling our breath in any way. So the goal is really to be the compassionate observer and just to notice what's happening in your body with your breath. So I am going to literally time us for a minute and I will ring a bell to begin and ring a bell to end. And it's up to you, you can keep your eyes open or closed. And you may begin. Wonderful. All right. <sighs> Catherine, whenever I do that, because we've, we've practiced this a few times, and I feel totally fine about my breath until I have to observe it. And then I'm like, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> I don't know if it's because we're doing a presentation, but. <laughs> That's I, a good point. It's like you... What's that? It's like you do a focus on it and then, and then you, I don't know, you say, yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it, it's much easier for me to do an intentional practice of my breath than just sitting there watching it. It's so funny. <laughs> All right, as we look at the what, why, and how of breathing, we want to talk about two ways our breath is a resource for us. It has an impact on our musculoskeletal system, and it is a gateway to our nervous system. So I'm trying to unblock <laughs> the words. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> At Body Dynamics, um, clinicians across modality, no matter uh, whether you're here for PT or fitness or massage or counseling or um, nutrition or any of the any of the modalities, we all encourage clients to move breath into all areas of their body to help unwind torsion or tension and to facilitate movement. So now we're going to, here's where things start to get really exciting. 
uh, we're going to look at the mechanics of breath and I have a little video to share with you. So we'll watch the video and as the video is playing, then I'll try to describe what's going on so that you can imagine it. Bear with me for the technological pieces of this. See if I can get us there. Here we go. Go. Hmm. Well, Catherine? Yeah. Do you Let see anything? No. Uh, it's not, for some reason, it's not clicking through to the video. Yeah, I'm going to. Well, I'm going to start, see if I can multitask. Because I also think I'm frozen for some reason, which isn't very good. So I hope people can hear me. Um, we can, hear, we can hear you, Lisa, but, you're, but the PowerPoint's not changing. You're correct. Yeah, and my... But we can hear you. Okay, well, I will... Um, let me see if I... Huh. Okay, well, I'm going to see if I can talk about this and hopefully something will change. It worked yesterday. So when we're breathing, there on an inhale, there's a three-dimensional expansion of your rib cage where your uh, rib cage opens out to the side and your sternum lifts forward and up. And then on the exhale, there's a recoil that happens where the rib cage drops back down and returns to its resting position. The diaphragm, which lives underneath the rib cage, is a skeletal muscle. It's made of the same muscles that your biceps are made of. And on the, the, the diaphragm is a three-dimensional uh, dome. On the inhale, the diaphragm drops down as the rib cage expands. And on the exhale, the rib cage lifts back up and the rib, and the rib cage uh, restores to its starting position. So the, the next thing was going to be practicing the uh, expansion of the rib cage and the diaphragm. So uh, what I invite you to do now is go ahead and put your hands on the bottom of your rib cage here. And you can even put them kind of laterally and take a deep breath, see what you notice. So you should feel and, and, and um, have a sense that your rib cage is expanding laterally like this. Now, Lisa was also uh, talking about just the three, dimension, three dimensionality of the rib cage. Go ahead and put a hand, just put one hand on your back and just one, one hand on your lower ribs as well. See if you can feel the breath going, kind of moving the back of your hand. So you would feel the breath into both hands. Good, so hopefully you're feeling that sense. Now finally, put one hand on your heart and another hand uh, on your torso, like around your belly button, lower ribs. 
And this time, take some deep breaths. See if you can let your lower hand fill up with air first, and then the upper hand joins. So you've got the, <laughs> hi Lisa. So you've got the rib cage now expanding lower and upper. You, just like Lisa mentioned, the sternum moves up on that inhale and then recoils. So hopefully you're feeling that sense when you put the hands different parts of your torso. We want to talk about now that you've felt that three-dimensional expansion of the rib cage. We want to talk about the different ways that breathing can help you. And we're going to start with the musculoskeletal system. So what we know is that um, as you felt that when you use that breath three-dimensionally and you get that full rib cage expansion, that you're getting, ideally, you're getting a full lung capacity, okay? And when we, and having a full lung capacity is indicative of actually your mortality. So there's a significant link between people's ability to fully inhale and exhale and how you know how the rest of their life is going to play out and it's particularly linked to cardiopulmonary function on top of that as you do that full inhale and exhale and hopefully you're getting that mobility through your ribs that's essential too because if your rib cage isn't moving then underneath it the lungs can't fill with air what um what i remember from pt from physical therapy school first was that study that was done by the framingham group in 1980 which basically correlated lung capacity to mortality and then i mean i remember a lot from pt school but specifically around the breath the second is that as we age we know overall our mobility decreases right our tissues dry out and you really can't drink enough water to go and hydrate a specific tissues in your body so if we don't practice keeping the middle of our bodies moving we're going to restrict our lung capacity more so just by practicing a full breath and i think anna commented that she only felt one side moving more than the other so focusing your breath into those restricted areas is going to be really helpful. Um, so that kind of leads us to this discussion about what is helpful musculoskeletally or systemically before we get into all the psychology and neurophysiology of it. And we have a lot of clinicians that will cue inhale into your tight spots you know when you're doing a cat and you're stretching try to breathe into that so we can get more expansion particularly in pilates we do that we do that three-dimensional inhale before we recruit the core and then our scolio pilates practitioners will really try to help direct breath so I, if you remember in the beginning that we can re decrease torsion that's going through our rib cage and our spine and we try to uh, excuse me unwind it with the breath but it might not be that it might not just be about the skeleton right oftentimes your trainers are going to say you know don't forget to breathe don't hold your breath and and why is that one is they want you to come into your body and be present with what's going on you know, the other is this is, you know, not rocket science. We need to oxygenate our blood. We need oxygen to go to our muscles so that they can perform appropriately. Now, if we discuss this a little bit more and let's talk a bit about the exhale. The exhale can be um, 
helpful when you exert, right? Let's say you're working with a trainer and you're trying to lift 40 pounds overhead or something. They might say, use the exhale. The reason they're doing that is likely because they want you to recruit the core, your core muscles, to give you some more stability so you can take the load against your body. Now, you can also get the core to kick in if you use a forced exhale. So by that, it, like I talked about, our breath is normally inhale, it expands, exhale, a natural recoil. Now, if we want to push that air out, we've got to have the core kick in to help get the air out even more. You can do it a few different ways. One is we do it through pursed lips and we kind of push the air out. That's a Pilates breath. You can also feel those abdominals kick in if you just do a prolonged exhale and really follow the air all the way out, right at the bottom of that exhale when you're getting that last bit of air out, the ribs are gonna close down and your core is gonna kick in a little bit more. And then in the Postural Restoration Institute, their method, they'll use a, a balloon and they'll use a balloon against your intra-abdominal pressure. And at the end of the exhale, the diaphragm, if you pause, then you give the diaphragm the opportunity to reset in an optimal position so you can get a better inhale for your next breath, okay? So I'm so glad that I, we recovered from that pause in the PowerPoint because I would have missed saying some of those things that I think are so exciting. So we're going to practice just the Pilates breath now. So we're gonna take a full inhale through the nose. Be careful you don't use your necks for the inhale, okay? So you don't, don't struggle, you know, cause that's not gonna be good for you. I'm, probably gave myself a crick in my neck demonstrating that. So on the inhale, you're gonna feel that three-dimensional expansion that you practice with Catherine. And then on the exhale, purse your lips and push that air out. And again, inhale. And exhale. and inhale and exhale and inhale and exhale and one more inhale and exhale So I was saying to Catherine, I'm so trained in this Pilates method that as soon as I purse my lips, my abdominals, those deep abdominals, the transverse abdominals all already start drawing in and kind of narrowing my waist three-dimensionally. If you're not used to doing that breath, I hope that at least you felt a little bit of your core kicking in at the end. Awesome, Lisa. Okay, um, so that is a wonderful overview of the musculoskeletal system and breath. Um, we turn now to the idea, the reality that breath is a gateway to our nervous system as well. Um, the unique thing about breathing is that it is both involuntary and voluntary. It is involuntary because our autonomic nervous system regulates it without us having to think about it. So along with heart rate, digestion, and other necessary functions of the body, we just breathe without it being a conscious decision. But it can be voluntary because we can also exert some control over our breathing by way of various breath patterns or techniques, some of which we are exploring today. 
the autonomic nervous system also oversees the sympathetic and parasympathetic functions of the nervous system. If we can exert some control over our breath, we have a way not only to impact our musculoskeletal system, but also to activate either the sympathetic fight or flight or parasympathetic rest and digest responses, giving us an incredible resource for regulating our entire system. So we know that one of the ways to get the parasympathetic system to kick in, remember that's the rest and digest, is by just prolonging your breath pattern, taking longer inhales and even longer exhales is going to shift you more into the parasympathetic even just taking longer inhales and exhales at the same time will get you somewhat partially there. And then if you extend the exhale even more, then you can um, get that parasympathetic system to kick in. And what happens when we do that is it gives our body the opportunity to let go. So if you think about the fight and flight response, which is the sympathetic, the fight, flight, freeze, our body is ready to fight. Our muscles are ready to run. So our global movers, are, the big muscles of our body are turned on. And in the clinical world, we say that it's your muscles are hypertonic. They're in tone and they're not letting go. And oftentimes we can relate that to pain syndromes people's necks always hurt, you know, their backs always hurt, things aren't turning off. And so if we can get to our muscles through our nervous system, we can shift. If we can prolong our breath, we can shift ourselves into the parasympathetic and some of that tension that we're feeling in our body can just dissipate just by changing our breath pattern. It's just so cool. The um, the other kind of cool, kind of nerdy thing <laughs> is that the um, when we when we go through these long breath patterns, um, th we know, and some of you that have really like delved into the anatomy know that the vagus nerve innervates the diaphragm, right? And in PT school, we learned C3, 4, 5 keeps the diaphragm alive. Remember that? Well, when you do these long breath patterns and you really get the diaphragm working, you get to massage that vagal nerve over and over again. And we call that actually increasing vagal tone. And we want the tone of the vagal nerve to go up because that helps us with our breathing function and our parasympathetic functions. What we know is that by going through the gateway of the nervous system with our breath, it can affect our blood pressure. It can affect our hormonal levels. Think about cortisol that happens in our sympathetic blah, adrenal mode. You can reduce stress and anxiety. You can, as we say, you could dissipate pain. You can dis dissipate tone. So Catherine found this quote. It, it goes like this. It's at the bottom of the screen. Breathing, unlike most physiological functions, can be controlled voluntary, voluntarily. And it can serve as an entry point for physiological and psychological regulation. My takeaway from that is that breathing is really the magic pill that everyone's been looking for. And it's super cheap, right? You can do it from home. You can easily practice it at any time. And um, I will say, and this is a good segue to our next point, is that we've been cueing this, but you do want to be cognizant that you're breathing through your nose. On, on your inhales. If you breathe through your mouth, you're 
shutting off all of, all of these functions that connect up to our brain and our nervous system. And again, I have so much more to learn about this, but I do know that if you're walking around and if you came on early, you heard Catherine and I talking about this, that if you are breathing through your mouth, your nervous system is just, it's, it goes haywire. You just don't have any, you don't have, your autonomic nervous system is just thrown completely off. And um, we learned a little bit about that. Again, I'll say one more time, we both have listened to this podcast by Terry Gross, who does Fresh Air on NPR. And she interviewed a man who's just written a new book and he was talking about it. So, um, if we do any more talks on breath, I'm sure we will dig deeper because there's so much to learn. Now, this next topic is so mind blowing to me. It turns out that we all have nasal cycles that should be happening all the time. One nostril is dominant and then you should shift to the other nostril. And those cycles last from between 30 minutes to two hours, but I have heard longer, maybe three hours. What I didn't know until recently is that each nostril relates to a side of the brain. So your right nostril relates to the left side of the brain. And the left side of the brain is more sympathetic dominant. Your left nostril goes to the right side of the brain and that's more parasympathetic dominant. So if you're living in a chronic state of somewhere between a tiger's going to get me and I need a nap, you know, if you're kind of like can't quite get to one side or, or other, which I think a lot of us feel because there's even before the pandemic there was this kind of vague vibration of urgency all the time but you know that there you're not actually going to get eaten immediately so um that can throw off our nasal cycles and if your nasal cycles are thrown off and you're biased to one side or the other or you're <sighs> stuck breathing through your nose, then we've lost the ability to regulate ourselves. So our nervous system gets out of balance and it's going to be harder for you to heal, right? It's going to be harder for you to call upon your sympathetic nervous system when you need it. And it's going to be harder for you to sleep at night. So your breath cycles can get off just by kind of this the world we live in, but it could also be because of other things that have happened, you know, um, stress or trauma or an injury or illness. And it's good to know that there are ways to reset it. And we're going to practice one of those right now. So we're going to practice the alternate nostril breathing. Yes. Okay. So um, if you are right-handed, you may want to use your right hand. If you're left-handed, you can use your left hand. Uh, but take one of, one of your hands, and um, what you want to do is fold down your forefinger and your middle finger. Now, your, your other fingers like to come along for the ride, but that's okay. They can just be curled, and then your thumb is out like this. What we're going to be doing is um, closing off one nostril and then the other, back and forth, back and forth. So that's the action that we're doing. There is a pattern to it. So before you close off any nostril, go ahead, take a deep expansive breath in through your nose and exhale. Okay. Go ahead and close your right nostril and inhale through your left nostril. Close your left nostril, exhale through your right. 
Inhale, right. Close your right, exhale, left. Inhale, left. Close left, exhale, right. Inhale, right. Close right, exhale, left. Inhale, left. Close left, exhale, right. Inhale, right. Close right, exhale, left. And just relax. I feel so good. I was just gonna ask you, how do you feel? I think after we did this yesterday too, I was like, I feel so happy now. I just have a sense of clarity right here. That's kind of the overwhelming feeling. Okay, uh, so. Oh, you know what I was gonna say oh, is. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, I was just gonna say um, in that alternate nostril breathing, you know, we're doing that at, at an even pace and that is supposed to help regulate the nervous system as we talked about but it's also good just to do an even inhale and exhale through both nostrils like if you're driving and you don't feel comfortable you can just practice that like we talked about four count or six count but trying to balance it so that you're not you're not biasing yourself one way or the other and when doing the alternate nostril breathing or just through both nostrils, we're keeping our mouth closed, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have delved into the parasympathetic a little bit and how breath can um, get that function or state of our nervous system activated um, so that we can really rest. Uh, that's the parasympathetic, rest and digest. And then we've talked a little bit about the sympathetic, which is the um, fight, flight, freeze, uh, where we're, we're on, uh, meet, where we need to be alert for, for certain things in our life. Um, but we want to be able to regulate both of those and not be too dominant in the sympathetic or or maybe even too dominant in the parasympathetic. So um, we wanted to show you this one minute uh, little clip. Um, it's Dr. Wheel, and I'll give you a couple of sentences about who he is. Um, he is an integrative medicine doctor and has been based at the University of Arizona, I think for many years. He's a popular editorial director of the popular website, drwheel.com. And he's a recognized expert on medicinal plants, alternative medicine, and the reform of medical education. But we, we liked his example of a stimulating breath. Um, this is something that I, I think Lisa would agree. I mean, we, we're, we haven't, I can say for myself, I haven't practiced this stimulating type of breath as much as the other really calming breaths. But we thought it would be fun to show you and then for us to practice. It's a very short um, practice. But let me get us to the clip, hopefully, and we can watch Dr. Wheel demonstrating.
stimulating breath or bellows breath is a yoga breathing technique that's um, rapid in and out breathing through the nose, a technique that wakes you up, uh, increases energy, also warms you. So I'll just demonstrate it to you. It looks like this. You can practice doing that for 10 seconds. Uh, you could try to increase it to 15 seconds, maybe up to a minute. I don't know that I'd do it more than that. But this is something you can try. It's very useful if you're falling asleep, getting drowsy in the afternoon. Also, if you're driving and beginning. Were you all seeing that? Not no, really. Catherine, we can hear it, but we couldn't see it. So you might need, you might want to demonstrate that again. We will. Please. Yeah, we will. We will demonstrate it. So. Uh, Although so we don't want to have to demonstrate this, <laughs> we will. <laughs> so what you'll do is keep your mouth closed for this, and you're doing quick breaths through the nose. And uh, I mean, would you say, Lisa, as quick as you can go? Or yeah, OK, kind of. As quick as you can go without it being about your neck, right? So. That's why we wanted him to do it because he can go so fast and we're both like. <laughs> so you, yeah, when, when the breath feels like it's in, it's ideal, it's, you can feel it in your abdominal muscles kind of doing the, the quick uh, expansion recoil. So anyway, you're, you, you only need to do this breath like no more than 10 seconds. So let's practice it. I will actually, uh, well, should we, we'll try to demonstrate it first. Okay, here we go. We'll both demonstrate it. Okay. <laughs> let's give it a go. I'm going to time us for 10 seconds. I will ding the bell at the end of 10 seconds. All right. So uh, in your comfortable position, here we go. You may begin. I finally Good. got my abdomen to kick in that time. I think that's, I've practiced this now for like almost a week and finally I can kill. <laughs> just like my nostrils beer, 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 beer. <laughs> well we, we wanted to give an example of how to access your sympathetic nervous system because sometimes we do need to uh, you know help ourselves become more alert like if we're on a long car drive or uh, have to give a presentation or <laughs> um, how, what else just driving in general anything that takes our alert kind of energy but well, do you want to say anything afternoon. else well i was gonna say like in the afternoon after i've eaten and i'm in my digest mode and i feel like having a nap but i've got to go back to work maybe this would be a good thing to do it's again like probably better for you than having a cup of coffee i could just do a stimulating breath um some um there some more little interesting nerd out factoids, okay, is that when you do that stimulating breath, if you were to put it into practice, it could actually help with weight loss. There's a study that shows that because I, you know, you're, when your sympathetic nervous system kicks in, things speed up, including your metabolism. Also, um, there was another study showing that it could reduce mid midriff fat. And we know that's like an indicator for a number of health risks. Um, but we do also know that, as we said, working on your parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system can, you know, it can help reduce blood pressure, right? It eases some of the work of the heart because your tape, you don't have to pump as much blood. Well, this could do the opposite because you're really trying to speed things up. So your blood pressure could go up with this. You could increase some of those sympathetic, other sympathetic um, um, 
characteristics. Aspects. Yeah, that, uh, and so you just want to consider that. And I think Dr. Wheel said like he would only do it for about a minute at a time because it's just meant to wake you up. You're not trying to put yourself into a hyperventilation or a panic attack or anything. So use hey. as needed. All right. Oh, here's our summary, Lisa. Yeah, so you guys, we love this topic. It is, it's just so fun to know that you can use your, just use your breath to change what's going on in your body, you know, and it's such an easy avenue and it really supports cultures all over the world you know thousands of years old have been practicing this and now you know we can have some western medicine to support what people have known in other cultures for a long long time um, just as a review we talked about you know how that full inhale and exhale can really help with your lung capacity and having a having a a large lung capacity has been correlated to having a long life, a long and healthy life. And we know that because now I only need to take a few breaths per minute that my heart doesn't have to work as hard. So now my cardio, not only my pulmonary system is improved, but my cardiovascular system is improved. We talked about how you can decrease your blood pressure just by getting your nasal breathing back on board, right? And, and having slower breaths. We talked about how having that good airflow and getting, getting oxygen through the nose up to the brain can help you with your mental health and your psychological states. We talked about how when you engage your parasympathetic nervous system, you can let go of some of that muscle guarding and tightness and, and, and make changes in your pain levels. Because we know that oftentimes trigger points, for example, are associated with lack of oxygen. So if we can you know, reduce tone and get some, let those muscles relax, pump the oxygen back in and you're feeling really good. And we talked about how it can rebalance the nervous system. We also talked about how we could use it to make us more alert. So um, we do, I, this is, you know, so great. I just can't believe how many things that we can do just by working on our breath. Um, do you want to show the bibliography? Yeah. And then yeah. I can I have, uh, sorry, go ahead. I have some, I have access to the questions here, but you can. Oh, great. Okay. Um, so Adria asked, it, can you give an example of clinically when you might introduce a client to the alternate nostril breathing? And I, I'm not you sure that. I was gonna. I would. I was gonna say that maybe in if you know if you if it becomes clear that um, a good a good um, trial treatment or ex experience for the client could be to rebalance the nervous system. I mean, I guess if if they're feeling if they're feeling um, challenge in their nervous system that is one way would you think Lisa or is there something more specific there might be yeah so I would um, I would either choose to use that alternate nostril breathing or or Adria I might tend to First, I probably would want them to access their parasympathetic first is what I'm thinking is if I'm noticing like I have a patient that, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that uh, 
and actually I have a patient right now that, that this is happening with that, you know, we do manual therapy and with manual therapy, I'm seeing some mobility clear up in her body. There's a decrease in muscle tension, but then she comes back and it's like, it's all there again. And, you know, the client has already told me that she is feeling anxious about things in her life and there's a lot of other stressors going on. And I might, I might say, you know what, I think we're, we may not be progressing in physical therapy because the nervous system is out of balance. That would be an indicator. I, I mean, at the point where I'm at right now, I almost feel like everyone I see needs to start doing some sort of breathing in order to arrive in, you know, in the moment to get the physical therapy they need. The other thing that we didn't talk about yet, but when your sympathetic nervous system is amped up and those fight or flight muscles are on, it kind of inhibits your postural muscles. It inhibits those muscles that are really meant to hold you up and to give you a deeper sense of stability. So <clears throat> if you're seeing you know, clients that are like hanging on to their upper traps, you know, and they can't let go of them. I mean, the upper traps are not supposed to hold your shoulders up. They're not supposed to help you breathe, right? Or if you see like their neck muscles just bulging out, like I need to get some of these deeper muscles working so that they're supported and they're not trying to hold themselves up with their hip flexors or their upper traps or God forbid their back and they're breathing with their back, you know? So when I see something like that, and this is not, this is, I, I mean, I'm, this was, was not intuitive two years ago, right? It's just because of kind of the dive that I've been going that now I'm really thinking about the nervous system, not just from a psychological state because we have counselors in our clinic and when we know someone's ah like has has some other stressors and that's keeping them amped up we'll refer but i've never thought about really prescribing breath i don't know why but <laughs> i never thought about prescribing breath but now i certainly will you know more and more i think Catherine and Lisa, I hate to do this because this has been so wonderful, but I promised you guys that we'd let you run at one because I know you both are going back into clinical care. So we're going to need to wrap it up. I'll let you guys say goodbye and tell everybody thank you for being here. And if you'd like to email us questions, we're happy to try to answer them. But we need, we need to say goodbye. Oh, shoot. I'm, I'm a, I was so excited about answering Anna's question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank can you I, all so much. Can I take a quick <laughs> stab? Can I take two minutes of a quick stab at this? You can, can sure. Okay, let me let me go. Let me go with this one. This one is so tough, okay? You guys don't, if, if you don't follow along, and Anna, we can totally have a long conversation about this offline since we work together. Um, so Anna said, do you know the biomechanical implications of one nostril versus the other? I didn't know the neurophysiological implications about right versus left brain, but I was noticing during practice that one nostril felt more swollen than the other. And I, I actually do know why this is because I just learned about it in a cranial course I took. So here's what they say. When you're breathing through your right nostril, let's say, your blood vessels constrict in order to get more airflow in. And the left nostril dilates and it will feel swollen. You might feel like it's plugged up. So that would sort of be normal in a reciprocal nasal cycle that one you know you feel more air going in one side than the other and that swollen feeling is the is basically the other side having 
a parasympathetic response. I don't want to say that too much because we talked about left nostril, right brain, parasympathetic. But when one is more clogged up, it's because it's not being used and you're not vacuuming the air in. So it, it, ha it shifts back and forth like that. And that would be normal. What would be really problematic if both feel swollen all the time? And then further on that, if that's sort of the way your life is, there's always that one nostril, that can lead to deviations in your septum and sort of rotations that happen in the bones of your skull to help keep air going into one side. So that's really why we wanna practice that alternating breath so that we don't stay biased only onto that one side. So I hope that helped. It's just fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> All right, guys.